Sorry. Okay, maybe that's hey folks, it's 7 o'clock. I'm going to get things started. I'm Eric. I'm the chair. I uh, want to introduce Hal and Aisha. They're from uh, Baldwin Hills Park and Rec District, and uh, they're going to tell us about some of the cool things that are happening. Uh, I want to kind of set the expectation for the meeting that we're going to convene on time at 7. I want to wrap up at 9. Um, or when we're done, hopefully nine or sooner. Um, as I said, we're going to talk uh, uh, with Helen and Aisha about uh, uh, THPRD's uh, stuff. And if you don't know what THPRD is, well, you can get that question answered shortly. Uh, later on tonight, after we do the Sheriff's Department and Fulton uh, Valley Fire and Rescue, we're going to have an election of officers for our uh, slate coming up for the next CPO season, because this is our annual meeting. And uh, that's pretty much all I got at the moment. Um, I do want to open it up to make sure if there's a, uh, oh, do you want to uh, sneak in a little bit of time? Just a tiny bit. Well, then why don't you come up here and do that now? And while you're coming up and doing that now, um, Luis Nava, would you take center stage and tell us about the cool stuff that your, your daughter just got done? Okay. I'd like to, yeah, stand up and talk about your kid. Oh. <laughs> and okay. embarrass her. Well, embarrass her for all the, the horrifically wonderful things she got done. Well, uh, I was. Um, Put her phone down. The, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Please. Ah. Um, I was planning to speak after the THPRD do their uh, inputs about the programs. And the reason why I came today, I'm a, a resident from Aloha, also wife of Ghani. And the reason uh, I bring my daughter, she's a disc golf player, as uh, well as my older two sons. And I just started, like uh, two months ago, I started playing too, because uh, I, when I attend to the different events, I saw that this is no a sport for one particular person. There is a sport for a family, you know? So when I attend to the different uh, venues, I saw not only youth or, or a regular person, but I saw completely family playing, you know? So if we can start uh, doing this sport more often, more common in our neighborhoods, I believe there is another way to integrate the fami family, the neighborhood, and so on. So uh, I'm glad to introduce my daughter. She is Michelle Nava. She is 12 years old. She is attending to Brown Middle School. And uh, last July, she attended to the World Championship in uh, Kansas. Wow. And she took, she took the first place. Oh. And uh, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. it was the U.S. the United States Women Disc Golf Championship, and because she got no competition at her level, she jumped to the women's division, and she played second. So she's doing very well, but you know. The reason why I want to talk to you is, especially the people from THPRD, is that here in our neighborhood, or also in Washington County, we don't have these golf courses. We got one here in, um, it belongs to Hillsboro, City of Hillsboro, Orchard Park, but it's half of the course. It's only nine holes, we need an 18 holes. And next year is gonna be the World Championship here in Oregon. And we have only three major parks, uh, Pierce Park, Blue Lake, and um, Milo McIver in Clackamas. But Washington County, we don't have parks uh, to that level. And, and we got several places that we can uh, build a, a facility. And the beauty of this is we don't need to spend a lot of money, you know, uh, building a park because as far as I know, and, and I visit almost 30 or 40 uh, different venues, and there is like a, in a, um, sometimes in an open spaces, but in other places is places where it's full of, of uh, wood, wood trees. Uh, trees, you know? So, uh, and the only expenses is to the basket and the teapot. So if we can bring those uh, facilities to our neighborhoods, 
I believe that will be wonderful for our community. Uh, we can involve our uh, kids in those events. Uh, my daughter, she was during the summer time after the tournament, the world tournament, she was uh, going to the different parts and teach the kids how to play the disc golf. So there is, the, you know, some interest for, so that would be wonderful if we can uh, do something else. So my question to you guys is, who is the person that we need to approach to in order to ask for, uh, you know, to start being or having these facilities in our neighborhoods, especially here in Washington County? Well, you can start with us. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the director of planning, at least for the time being, for uh, the 12th Mills Park and Recreation District, or THPRD. And Aisha is the deputy director. She'll be the director of planning in about nine months. And uh, I should note that we do have one disc golf course uh, within our district in Greenway Park. We used that course before. I'm not saying it's a good course. There are certainly conflicts there because there is a trail through there and other users and that can cause problems. But uh, we do have that one course in Greenway Park, which of course is located uh, between Schultz Ferry Road and Hull Boulevard, uh, just to the west of Highway 217. Uh, but we have heard from others in the community who have an interest in disc golf, and so uh, we'll try to see what we can come up with in terms of other locations. The challenge with uh, a sport like disc golf is though the level of improvement required is, is pretty low. It doesn't cost a lot of money to build the disc golf course does take quite a bit of space. And uh, as we all know, uh, this is a fairly urban area. There's not a lot of space to be found uh, for park development. We'll talk about some of the sites that we've acquired in this area uh, recently in a few minutes. But uh, we certainly will take a look at this. So, you know, I, I think this golf is an excellent sport for younger folks or just people from whatever age group in, in the community. Uh, so uh, take your request to heart and see what we can come up with. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. Hey, Steve, you want to take it away for uh, real briefly? I had a question. Is there, is there an equivalent, like a pitch and putt equivalent to that? Uh, where that wouldn't take so much space? I wonder. I don't know. I've never seen any. I'm not aware of it. So. Uh, we, we can share the part with another. But we don't need the. It's like, for example, the golf course, you know? You need the space only for playing golf, mm -hmm. you know? But in this case, we can share the park with anybody else, with playgrounds, with picnic areas. The only we need is not the full area. We need only certain areas, you know? So so if we could get your contact information, uh, maybe I should get that from you, uh, and we'll get back to you. But maybe we could get some input on you about the course that we have now mm -hmm. in the park where we do share space with other users and uh, see if there's um, a way to improve that site at least uh, and uh, maybe we can get some thoughts on how we might improve the design there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so. What you been doing, Steve? Uh, what have you been harassing? Uh, I've been harassing the, the mirror of Mayor, I actually the city council. I was uh, got got tried to talk to those people the other night at their meeting on Tuesday. Was there was their second reading of the South Hillsborough transportation plan, and um, they chose. Uh, it's it is their uh, prerogative to have a hearing or not on it. Uh, most jurisdictions, the elected officials have at least one hearing on any plan amendment which this qualifies as a major plan amendment, but they chose not to. And they had their only hearings before the appointed planning commission, and I've already reported on, on a testimony on that. But basically, my testimony to the city council, once again, was uh, with the last two, uh, I've done it twice this last month since we've gotten together, because they had their meetings for two weeks apart, was it's not too late to stop and reevaluate this now that you have this information. 
you didn't never had traffic information before in the, all of these 15 years. You now have the document right here that you're set to approve. And in the case last night, I spoke after, you know, in, during the public comment period because they didn't allow me to speak while they were talking about the transportation plan. And so I said, this document you just adopted um, is brand new. I mean, that's why I'm here to talk to you about it. And so I told them that they, you know, that it shows that they're going to take a great deal of cooperation um, between a lot of jurisdictions for them to pull off the many hundreds of millions of dollars of improvements that have to occur off-site. Uh, now that they're finally acknowledging this, and this is just within the last nine months or less that they've acknowledged that there are any impacts off-site to drop in 30,000 people across the street. So it's good. They're, they're making a movement towards that. But they're justifying moving forward by saying, now we've got a plan. Well, their plan, I say, yeah, you've got a plan, but it's only a paper plan because you've got no commitments from anybody else that you've committed their money. You've committed a little bit of money for the city way off into the future, now and off into the future. You can't even say for sure that future city councils are going to honor that commitment because it's out of the city. It's, you know, it's not part of their transportation plan. And uh, for sure, you can't say that even this Board of County Commissioners is going to go for repurposing all of the roads in Aloha to handle your traffic that you've now directed off. I mean, you've admitted in this plan that the reason you need to direct all this traffic into Aloha East and West is because the elected officials decided last spring that TV Highway is full, but that's okay and they're not going to do anything to make it any bigger or facilitate any more capacity on it. So you had to kind of switch to switch taking your east-west traffic on to Kinnaman and Blanton and Rosa oh, and Farmington. Farmington, all these other roads. And you've committed the county's money to rebuilding those roads and your money to rebuilding a few intersections here and there, very few roadways. And um, so I, you know, how can you call that a plan? And, and uh, the mayor, and so I just outlined that, and um, I said, you know, for that and for, I'll, I'm providing you with a, with a way out here. This wasn't your idea. This started 15 years ago. It was brought forward by people, administrators, who made a deal with a couple of out-of-state uh, landowners to, that if they, did a, they paid for a big portion of the planning or a portion of the planning that, it was okay, you know, that they would back this proposal to come in. But, you know, those people aren't around anymore. And those elected officials that started that way back when, and that, you know, your name is going to be associated with approving this. This, your, this council right here, you guys, this is your legacy. And um, I, you know, got, you ought to really think seriously about whether you want this to be your legacy. Because you don't really, you know, you're really balancing the budget, so to speak, of the South Hills Road Transportation Plan on the backs of the residents of Aloha and Reedville. You're relying upon them to somehow either come up with a bunch of the money, because the county commissioners aren't going to, to repurpose their roads, which doesn't make a lot of sense because then their driveways are not going to be usable. You know, arterials have different standards of access in which personal driveways aren't really supposed to be part of the deal. And you know, you're, you're impacting a lower reed, but you're taking away their property values, yet you're going to ask them to pay for to do that. So, you know, it, just in fairness, you ought to realize that this is part of, of your legacy. And, and I said, you know, I'll, I'm providing you this outline that, uh, and I have copies of this if anybody wants it, um, that gives you some findings, that, you know, in other words, some reasons why you'd like to stop the process out now. So I said, not stop it, but suspend it while you reevaluate your options. And um, then I went on, and I just barely outlined those, the high points of that outline, because I, you know, I wanted to add a little bit more to my testimony. And they're only giving me three minutes, of which I'm about hitting three minutes at this point. And I said, I'd just like to add a couple more things. And so Janelle Josephson, who we all know, who wrote the Aloha Reedville book, um, provided testimony to the Planning Commission that uh, was very germane, I thought, about the history of this site, of the Latin Reed Farm and the Hague Farm. Uh, and so I, I grabbed a few sentences out of her testimony, and I was just reading those few sentences. I mean, because this is stuff, I mean, my grandparents lived on that. One of my sets of grandparents lived on that farm over there, and yet this is stuff I didn't even know about that happened before they were there. Well, um, and I just thought it was interesting that at the very beginning of Oregon State 
university, agricultural school, happened right over across the street, that um, uh, Ladd and Reed, uh, you know, and, uh, and Ladd became, who was mayor of Portland at the time, uh, and twice mayor, um, was one of the regions that started Oregon State, and eventually it, it moved to Corvallis, and interestingly enough, a future governor immigrated from England to work on this, because it was a scientific place. It was a place where they had the first true-blooded of certain kinds of cattle that they brought to the Northwest, and it was a, it was a big deal. People from all over the country were, and the world, apparently, were coming here, because an Englishman came here named With, Withicum, who later became the governor of Oregon. And I just thought that this was kind of good information. And I said, look, you're, you're renaming a place, South Hillsboro, that's already got a name, that's already got a place. It is a place, and it's been a place for a long time, a very historic place, something you ought to recognize. I just you know, didn't get as far as I just got into it right there with you when the mayor stopped me and said, hey, look, if this bus left the station a long time ago. And um, as if the transportation plan they were adopting right then was it shouldn't be part of their decision-making process, and uh, told me that it was time that I you know, quit quit with this line of reasoning and just got on board and helped them uh, make it work, and um, and then went on to explain to me that uh, that uh, they had looked at alternative sites by his involvement in the urban reserves process, which he was involved with a couple years ago. And uh, I didn't want to tell him that they were kind of separate processes. The Urban Growth County Amendment process occurred a couple decades ago, or a decade and a half ago, and the Urban Reserve process occurred five years ago, and really it wasn't the same thing. And I wanted to say that, but I didn't, because he was kind of angry. So I just stopped. I just stopped my testimony. And then, so you, can I jump in? Uh, I'm going to have to catch up here shortly, but there's two questions that are burning, and one of which is, um, one of my concerns, <coughs> I was shocked when I, I went through NN, uh, NPIR, or NF, National Flood Insur Insurance Production. And one of the things that you, and I give you credit for, is that uh, Butternut Creek <coughs> and tributaries, and basically you called South Hills, the South Hills World process to the planners to say it's uphill, and we're downhill from Aloha. Clean Water Services has directly told the city of Hillsborough Aloha behaves like a bathtub. In this process, going back in the last linear year, has Hillsborough embraced that, or is Washington County just going to be downstream of this and uh, with the pervious surfaces, or the impervious surfaces that they're going to build, or are we just going to get flooded out? I, I guess, okay. has that had any, tr I know that you were just dealing with the transportation issue, yeah. I also, yeah. also have a little piece of information about that. Okay. Um, are they acknowledging they, it? They, don't, they I haven't noticed anything in their plans to acknowledge it thus far, except to say we're going to deal with it. Um, I've also pointed out that the northwest portion of South Hillsboro actually doesn't go to Butternut Creek. It goes to north and east to, to Reedville Creek. I pointed that out to them numerous times over the last 15 years, and none of their maps still acknowledge that. Interesting, though, there was an open house uh, over here at the school, what's it called, Rosedale School, right through the field over here. Um, when was that? Three weeks ago, maybe now? And um, the, I was happened to end up sitting right next to the woman who's a consultant who's doing the flood stuff for mm -hmm. South Hillsborough, for the city. And so I had a chance to talk to her about that, that we, you know, that we are very concerned, that we don't think you're dealing with it. And, um, don't blame it on, you know, because their, their attitude so far is, well, Aloha was built wrong. It was built before, it was built before all the new regulations, so it's not our problem. It's kind of like the roads in Aloha. It's not our problem because it happened before. And I said, yeah, it's your problem. You know, and no, Aloha was, wasn't built incorrectly. It was built according to the rules then. Okay. Yes. And, um, yeah, you know, I mean, a couple, an inch or two of height of raising you know, they're, they're keep talking downstream. I, I say, no, upstream. You could, a couple inches of hike over here, considering how many roofs and streets you're going to dump in over there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of gallons of water. It could conceivably raise it up because it's not all that far. And, the, and she said, you know, you're, you're right in the sense that there is very little uphill until you get to the base of, of Cooper Mountain. I said, exactly. You know, this is the up end, up end of Butternut Creek. 
And she said, well, I'll, I'll, you know, okay, we'll work on that. I'll, I'll, we'll get, I'll get back we'll to you. We'll work on that. Yeah, we'll work on that. And, then, and I also pointed out this idea that the northwest corner, or the north, northeast corner. We'll work on that as a really good segue to my last question, which I'd really like just a brief answer to so we can keep the meeting going. Yeah. That's um, the undesignated and the urban reserves process is basically constipated in the courts has tied up a lot of land stuff. Are, is that one of the issues that is going to be holding them back? Or are they gung-ho, ready to plan, or are they still on a leash with the Urban Reserves Court decision? There's the urban, they keep referring to a couple of court decisions, and I'm not exactly sure what all they are. Okay. But uh, I do know that the Urban Reserves is one of them. I'm not sure what the other one is. I can remember Thousand Friends had something going for a while. Wasn't there something like that? And there's a, there's a, reserves decision that was heard by the um, Court of Appeals, and that one is, we're awaiting a decision on that, the whole region is. Um, but they are, the Court of Appeals will not act on the UGB appeal until the reserves question is answered. So those are the two. So there's a UGB appeal also. Yes. The Thousand Friends maybe, or somebody. I, I think there's a variety. A variety of people, comments. not none of which are us. As far as if I, I could give a hint to the other side <laughs> of the room, one of my concerns that I want to ask a question about later on is like, is Oregon's land use law so messy that we can't find land for parks and schools? And I think that's, I, I kind of already know the answer, but I want to clue those guys in as well. Um, Steve, okay, do you have so, other emergency yeah, uh, dispensations? As far as I know, that's it for South Hills, but for a little while, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm okay. to receive some more information. Um, the Aloha Reedville planning next uh, CAC meeting for it is next uh, Wednesday at 6. At Edwards Center? At Edwards Center on Kinnaman Road. 530, 545? So, uh, at 6. 6, six o'clock. We were able to tip in the uh, framework plan workshop into the meeting. Okay, so, so it's we all contained there. six to eight thirty. Okay, and beautiful. You're all welcome to come. Please. Beautiful, Deputy Whitley, if you'd come, uh, be kind enough to come on up and give us a, a presentation, I'd like to call for some applause for Steve Moore. Thank you. Steve has really worked very, very hard in order to keep us up to date on some really complex issues, and uh, uh, I just really am very thankful for that because it's this. Technically, it's a very complex mess, and you're tracking it very well and uh, advocating for a law. That I'm grateful for. Thanks. Floor's yours. Come on up, give us an update. Good evening. So, I am handout heavy tonight. We will get these going around our chat. First thing I'll start going around is uh, our map of the selected property crimes calls for service. So, again, this breaks down into north of TV Highway, south of TV Highway. It's, it's a generalized call type. It doesn't get into specifics of the calls, but it gives you an idea of the calls for service out here. So I'll start those going around. Another thing I have is the latest copy of the Neighborhood Watch News. I don't know how many folks in here get a, a paper copy of this. But this is the latest issue of this, so I'll start that going around too, so everybody can grab a copy if they want one. One thing on the Neighborhood Watch News is I've got a letter here from the Sheriff's Office, just to give you a quick summary on it. They're combining the Neighborhood Watch News with the Sheriff's Office News. They've been doing kind of two slightly different newsletters, but they touch on a lot of the same topics. So they're combining the two, and it's going to an all electronic distribution. So we're not going to be doing the printed newsletter anymore. It's kind of a day and age where we can save quite a bit of resources just doing the e-distribution. And I've got a sample here of the Sheriff's Office news. This is just a printout of the online version that goes out. I've only got one, so if you want to just pass around to look at it. But it gives you an idea. One of the huge advantages is with a print newsletter, we've only got so much real estate, we can get stuff in there and get it out to you. With the e-newsletter, we can throw in hot links to actual, uh, there's articles in there where there's links to the actual ordinance language and things like that, where you can get a lot more cross-reference information in there so that we can get a lot more detail out to you guys. So uh, I'm gonna pass this around. This is the letter saying that we're combining the two. What this does is gives a contact email if you would like to, if you don't already. If you already subscribe to the electronic sheriff's news, you don't need to do anything. You'll just keep receiving it. If you don't, then I encourage you to take one of these. There's a link in here or an email in here that you can send a letter to saying, I'd like to receive 
the images that are, and then you'll start receiving that every time it goes out. And if you run out of these, let me know, and we, we can, you know, hopefully Eric can post or we'll get out that email link. The uh, newsletter itself, great content in there. There's always kind of uh, current, relevant articles in there. One of the ones that I just want to touch on really quickly tonight is there is an article in there regarding uh, young, younger age, kind of late teens, early teens, and sex crimes. As a parent of teenagers myself, I think it's very important to know this. If you have teens or have grandkids who will be teens soon, it's very good to know that a lot of people don't realize that as you turn 18, whether you do it as a senior in high school, whether you graduate high school, and let's say you have a girlfriend who is 16, and she might be a junior, sophomore, something in that range, you get into a legal area. And it's not a moral conversation. It's, it doesn't tread anywhere on whether you allow your child to do that or what your tolerance level is or what your standards are. It's simply an article that covers the legal issues of it. Uh, because what we see, especially with electronic communication, with the cell phones, with uh, Snapchat, and a lot of these e-communications that Things get out in the electronic media, and then they bring relationships to the surface that maybe one parent knows about, but another doesn't. If one gets upset with the other, next thing you know, we get a phone call, and there may actually be crimes occurring there, even if they've been dating for two years already, and one of them leaves school and becomes over 18. There are issues there to be aware of. So that article is in there, and again, if you send an email to ask, they've got the actual ordinances in there that talk about what the language is of the statutes, and it's just an important conversation to have with your, with your late teens to realize, you know, it's it's not the end of the world, but you've got to really be careful about what's going on here because you, you can be held liable for, for criminal charges. And, and again, it's it's not like we're, we're talking, you know, serious, aggressive sex crimes. It's just something that happens that is technically illegal in the state, so it's good to make them aware of that. The last thing I want to cover tonight, and it's another article that's in the newsletter, is we are currently doing a, a sizable hiring push. Uh, we've got brochures that are just freshly printed up that I'd like to pass around. Uh, if any of you are dying to be deputies, now's the time. If you know somebody qualified, if you have neighbors, friends, somebody coming back from military service that's looking for work, we are very interested in reviewing new applicants right now. We've got a special insert in here, Women Make Great Deputies, that you'll see in there. We are particularly uh, kind of reaching out right now to female deputies. We like to increase our numbers. We find that they have a lot of advantages. A lot of people think, oh, a, a female cop is not going to be as effective. It's quite the opposite of that. A lot of the times when you've got a tense situation or you've got a sensitive situation involving juveniles, sex crimes, things like that, a female deputy arriving to the scene uh, garners a much different response from people than having a male deputy show up. So and we, are, we are looking at everybody. But we're definitely interested in if you know any females that are that would like to apply and, and talk to the sheriff's office. So I will get those going on. I don't have a ton of these, but we've always got more of them and we can get two more. Yes, ma'am. I had a question because it seems like this month, because I usually come every month, um, I'd like to first of all know what the difference is between stolen vehicle and theft of vehicle. And it looks like there's a lot um, north of TV Highway this month. Is that unusual? As far as the patterns, I don't know what the long-term patterns are on the vehicles. Typically, when you see the difference, uh, and what, what's the verbiage on there? Is it, it says stolen on three of them, and then there's about seven or eight that says theft of vehicle. That's and, like so many. What? Okay. So it, what it might be referring to is theft from vehicle. Or oh, theft from car, vehicle. Okay. Yeah, what we call the car clout, which is, and again, I, I can tell you 90% of those typically are unlocked doors, and it's people coming around in the wee hours. They'll walk down a neighborhood street and check handles. If it's unlocked, whatever's in it is theirs, and there might be another car a block down that was unlocked. They typically don't want to draw a lot of attention to the great glass. It does happen occasionally, but only if there's some high dollar item that's visible that they say, I want that. But just unlocked cars is, a lot of the times that's where most of those come from. And the stolen vehicles, too, could be referring to a vehicle stolen or recovered stolen. Again, it doesn't specify the call type, so we might have a car that was stolen in Tigard, and it gets recovered, you know, down off Rosa and 209, and somebody finds it parked, and, and that would fall under the same category. Any other questions tonight? I know. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I got the Neighborhood Watch online and um, newsletter, and it identified the... Uh, the uh, 
safety prevention or a women's defense or some yes. kind of a class. And that was, said it was limited to 80 members. And the day I got it, I emailed Jessica and asked, and she said, I'm sorry, it's already full. And I'm wondering how, and she said, I don't think there are going to be any more until next year, which I've been looking for that for a long time. Right. Well, and we're, we're going into October right now. So yeah. typically, SARS, do they do that twice a year? There are the next, um, the Women's Safety Fair, we yeah. do once a year. The Power Curve class. We'll be doing another one in January, but it won't be a women's safety fair. Really can, wish you'd have use... more of them. You know? um, they cost a lot of money. They... To... Yeah, because you have, uh, if you have 80 women, we'll probably have 10 defensive tactics instructors. So it's very costly. Well, I know it was yeah. free. You could yeah. charge But I mean, it's something. free to you, but someone has to pay for it. Your tax dollars. No, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's Even hard. then, you wouldn't have been able to. Oh. Yeah, you, it would be pretty expensive, oh. and we don't want to have to. Well, is there a way, I mean, uh, is the newsletter the best way to find out when they're occurring, or is there another way that we can uh, I know there's going to be one in January. It's either going to be the second or third week in January. I don't have the exact dates. Okay. Um, but just keep your eye on the, just go back to our, our website. Okay. Um, I know, I wish we could do more of them. We'll do another all day Saturday in May, but it won't be a safety fair where we invite businesses to come in and show I'm their bad. stuff. Yeah. But the hands on thing is really valuable. It's just. Yeah, Dar, would you mind explaining real quick the difference between the Women's Safety Fair and the Power Curve? Yeah, the Power Curve is just a Tuesday and Thursday night. The Tuesday night is a, a PowerPoint presentation about personal safety, and then they take you up on the mats and they let you. I don't take this offensive bob. They, you get to strike a bob, you know. A, 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 <laughs> <laughs> a lot of women, a lot of women we'll don't know how to. There. A lot of Thanks. women don't know how to strike, and so they show you how to strike. And then on Thursday, you come back and you you take the skills that you learn from Tuesday and you reapply them on Thursday night. So um, years ago, I used to say, you know, let them come, and then you get old and. Mm -hmm. You use a cane and you realize that you A cane can be used as a weapon. Yeah. Well, I don't know how, and that's why I was Well, oh, so you'd be surprised. I'll show you how to use one. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, so awesome. just keep your eyes on our website. It's, I know we'll do like four or five of the Tuesday, Thursdays throughout the year. We just can't, yeah, we just can't financially afford doing it anymore. And, we, and be honest with you, we don't have enough room anymore because we're also training our regular deputies, and so we don't even have enough room in our training centers, so... So when do you have them uh, this year anymore? We only have the one woman safety fair, which is already booked in October, because we've tried to do them in during the holidays, and um, we can't right. just teach for six women. We yeah. have to have a, a minimal amount of women. So we quit doing them during the winter because a lot of us are doing holiday stuff. So we start back up in January. So. Oh, Queen of the Sheriff's Office, you want to come up here? Sure. It's Darlene Schnorr. She's Hi, the Queen everybody. of the Sheriff's Office. Hi. You're going to uh, help me get to the calendar because you guys have an online oh, calendar. Oh, put the calendar where it says calendar. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because, uh, <laughs> oh, you know what? We're in the process of updating it. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I hear that a lot from the no, Sheriff's Department. I know. I'm going to delete the dates. We probably have to check it back tomorrow because okay. we're changing our. IT folks. So. so I saw it today before I came. But I know it's there. Like, what do you mean that? Yeah, but you got the magic pass. So I, I did. I wanted to show you that the, there's a lot of really cool things on the sheriff's department website, including the calendar. So if you got classes you want to sign up for or check, that's a, and often there's like links to people's email address so you can apply or see when they may open. Uh, that's just another resource. And for I you. think if you scroll down, Eric, there may be like the power curve. Yeah, join the power curve. A little blue. Yeah, that will show the most current dates when we come oh. up. You scroll down. I didn't know what it was called. It's so hard yeah. And part so <laughs> this is where the dates will be showing up for our next classes. I know we're doing one in January. I do know that. So. Seems like an odd name. Power curve? Yeah, because it replaced smack the crap out of boys and that didn't fly well. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come up with the name. It was before I put the time to I got a question for yes, you. Um, one of my concerns is that uh, uh, states uh, order Washington State is going to probably have recreational marijuana for sale, and uh, I think that people should be able to make their own personal choices, including that one. On the other hand, there's a place where I don't think um, weed belongs, and that's 
and high schools. So we potentially could have somebody 18 years of age who's a senior in high school drive up to Washington State and buy weed because they're in that state, and that could be the age of majority up there. Well, that'd be 21. Um, well, 21. Okay. Well, I think it's just going to make it one step easier to, to get marijuana. Do you have a no. position or a? Um, and is there a strategy or position with Washington County Sheriff's so Office? So the, the sheriff has that? been very clear on the fact that because we already have had incidents with uh, uh, dispensaries in Washington County that yeah. are designed, what they say is they're designed to only provide for people that have the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program card mm -hmm. and that they are set up to be a dispensary and not like a pharmacy for people that have the card and have access to that. Uh, in Washington County, we have been very aggressive about investigating those, and we have made several of us where we shut them down entirely because you find that they're selling to whoever walks in the door, and they're not supposed to be charging for profit. They're supposed to be a reasonable compensation mm -hmm. for the grower's time, things like that. We find that uh, really the majority of the time that they are abusing what the loophole is. Now, that's going to vary from place to place. Multnomah County is not aggressive at all with with going after the dispensaries. Uh, and again, for them, they say, you know, it's a resource issue, it's a priority issue. I can tell you it's a very high priority in Washington County. Uh, I think we've got enough issues just with the OMMP program that we're dealing with making sure registries current, things are current, but to have the dispensaries adds another level where uh, a lot of people abuse loopholes. So, I don't know if there's online. I, I know in the past I've, I've read the sheriff's commenting on Oregonian articles about it and just basically saying we will remain vigilant and we will remain opposed to dispensaries, things like that in our area. If somebody drives to Washington and they buy it there, more power to them. If they come back to Washington County and they do not have an OMMP registration and they are not uh, in any way licensed to be in possession of marijuana, then they will face the same charges as anybody else who bought it or grew it here locally and, and will get charged with possession depending on weight is what it would be. So it's, and, and I know we've got a great set of SROs that work all the schools mm -hmm. here in Washington County and they are very on top of, of those things. And unfortunately, it is very pervasive and as it becomes more legal and as you get moms and dads and adults that have a prescription, then it becomes normalized for the kids. It becomes, you know, well, I see aunt so-and-so smoking all the time and all that. So it becomes normalized and it, and it does, I think, create more of a culture in the schools where it has become normalized, but that doesn't make it any more illegal for people that are not a part of the program. Okay, great, great answer. Do we have any more questions? Miles? No, I'm just, oh. Okay, I saw a hand going up. I saw a brief movement out there. Well, then, on that note, I'm going to call for some applause. We've got any firefighters in the house? No. We're going to put you in the hot seat, but you're used to. Don't you have training for that? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. That would, that would be okay. <laughs> Your local sheriff's department is not too thorough and warm like they should, so I'm going to go for them for a minute. Um, so, from my perspective on the street is we have a great group of cops with Washington County Sheriff's Office. Um, I go out on the streets on all, a lot of the calls that they go on, whether it's drunk kids, car wrecks, marijuana, you name it. And what I see with our cops is they. There's a dog under there. <laughs> She's licensed. <laughs> <laughs> she she looks ferocious. Very much um, so. But I see a bunch of cops that go and they fix problems. Too often, I think our cops get the reputation of uh, all problems are nails and we have a hammer and they put cuffs on it and boom and they fix it. Um, I was on a call just a couple days ago where it was a van full of teenagers. Some might have imbibed a little. Thank you. <laughs> and the way they dealt with the kids, rather than just going, oh, you dumb kid, I'm putting the cuffs on, we're going. But I, there were three or four of them there making all the phone calls to moms and dads, making sure that a couple of them who had possibly imbibed a little too much 
got into the ambulance to the hospital, and I saw them solving problems, not seeing every problem as a nail that needs to be hit with a hammer. Um, another big one that's, that has been in the works for, it's been getting bigger and bigger and better and better over the last couple of years, is their mental health response team, the Sheriff's Department, from 9 a.m., maybe 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night. It's a little later than that. I can't remember. Anyways, they have one vehicle out there that has a mental health response professional. And, you know, Portland gets in the news because they have, a, I think they have a lot more mental, people with mental health issues and how their police deal with it. Um, I don't want to compare the two, but this is something that Washington County Sheriff's Office is trying to get ahead of the power curve with having them. And we use them as a firefighter. I use them as a resource all the time. Hey, is the uh, mental health team person on right now? Get them out here. And there's parts of the lower that are slightly lower socioeconomic that have some issues. And uh, they've done a great job <coughs> trying to fix problems. So sorry they didn't do that. But, so pass that on to them. I right, tooted the horn for them. Anyway, um, it's being recorded, and I'm sure that the police watch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they, they they're, they're a really good bunch of men and women. And we, we come in here and we talk about the things we try to do, but they don't always say the good things they're doing. Um, oh, sorry, my name is Jim Strait. I'm a lieutenant over at Station 6-2. Uh, I think I've only been here at the CPO meeting once, maybe twice before. Sounds about right. Once or twice. Um, I know there's at least a couple faces I've seen in here because I spent a lot of years up on uh, Cooper Mountain, so I'm pretty familiar with the area as it is. Um, I haven't got quite as much exciting information as the, the deputy did, but I thought I'd bring in some call information. Uh, over the summertime, uh, in our, this CPO, CPO 6, Reedville, Aloha, Cooper Mountain, uh, the fire department ran almost 700 calls, 682 calls in the area. The bulk of them come out of this station, um, our, this station here. I didn't run the station alone for the quarter, but I ran numbers for just a month. In the month of September, uh, we ran 417 calls. So the, the bulk of the calls come out of... Uh, uh, Aloha for the Cooper Mountain rebuild Aloha area. What's the busiest month typically for the fire department? You know, I don't know that there's a busiest month. Because I was just wondering, like Fourth of July fire. Well, you know, there, the, or... every season has its flavor, and there are spikes. I mean, Fourth of July obviously is busier. Friday and Saturday nights at certain stations are busier. Um, Christmas time, the holiday seasons are busier. Um, and each season has its own flavor of calls. Um, for instance, now people are starting to turn on their hot their furnaces, they're starting to turn on their wood stoves. Guess what comes with that? Furnace fires, chimney fires. Christmas time, you get uh, a lot of health issues, all the stress from the holidays, things like that. Uh, come, once the sun, sun comes out, people go outside, we start to see the traumas. Once it gets dry, we're done with that. <laughs> we have our grass fire. So there's not really a, which is busiest, just the flavor of the month changes. So kind of, thank you for a segue there. Um, safety tip du jour. Uh, we've already started going on house fires. We were uh, just on one. So you just, that was your first day at our station, right? Yes. Yeah, one of our newer firefighters, Brent Swartz. Uh, first day at our station, we had a house fire, which was caused by the first time they turned on the furnace. The furnace hadn't been cleaned. All the dust in there went woof, and off to the races, the, flame, the flames whipped. Uh, so um, as you start turning on your furnaces, which most of you probably have, be thinking, keeping them clean. And same thing with fireplaces. Check the chimney flue. We've been on, were you with me when we went on the chimney flue fire? It was not there. We always, at this time of the year, go on fires where there's smoke in my house. Did you open the chimney flue? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes the chimney work. You mean the damper. Damper. Uh, yeah. 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 The thing that opens the pipe. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we go on, on those quite a bit. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of discussion, uh, let's see, from yourself pertaining to, um, let's see, I'm not going to say South Hillsboro. Property across the street. West, West Reedville. West Reedville. <laughs> South Reedville? West Reedville? Didn't it, I, we used to always refer to that as a St. Mary's property. Yes. Was well, yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. Was yeah. That was one of the owners for many years. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, um, that along with you know the uh, efforts to improve parts of TV Highway, you know I know there's been efforts to get grants. 
Um, our fire department is not um, involved, per se, in the decision making, but we are involved in dealing with issues such as uh, ac access for fire apparatus, um, the different transportation corridors that you know, we would have concerns with to make sure that we can get from point A to point B, as well as, as that property gets developed over there, um, it, it's kind of a, it, uh, you know, it's Hillsborough's property, therefore the city of Hillsborough's fire department covers it, but we have mutual aid agreements with all our surrounding departments where there's many times where we go across their border and they come across ours. And so there are people of several pay grades above me that are working together with Hillsborough Fire to make sure that um, as that area is developed, access is appropriate and um, coverage uh, response times uh, for emergency incidents is appropriately taken care of. Yes, sir. Well, wasn't there an agreement at one time where you guys were supposed to serve a portion of what's now? The yes. Yeah. Uh, back in, I want to say it's 1998, there was something referred to as Senate Bill 122. And uh, correct me if I'm mistaken on this, but that was the, the bill that came out where it basically said, okay, if you're unincorporated and you're going to become a part of a county, we got to draw a line as to where it is. And I, which city are you going to end up? Which which city is Aloha going to end up? Is it Beaverton or is it Hillsboro? Or are they going to make their own? So, my understanding is the line, for the most part, follows the school district boundary line. And I, I believe there's a few oddball places here and there, but I, I don't know the details on that. Along with that, when that came out in early 2000s, our our fire department signed a, a, a contract or an agreement uh, with the city of Hillsboro pertaining to. Um, who would cover that area, how it would be covered, as well as uh, where the tax dollars went. Mm -hmm. and now, if you want more specific detail on that, I'd have to put you in contact with uh, one of our public affairs officers, because I don't know... It hasn't been worked out yet, though. I mean, there's, there was conflict there. Yeah, uh, there was conflict just recently. Um, Park it with Cassandra Alden. Yes. Okay. <laughs> She, uh, either that or we have a new uh, public affairs officer officer that works out of this office, our North Division office, by the name of Alyssa Coor, wonderful lady, and she also has all the ins and outs, because she's now, that she's working up in this area. Did Walt uh, retire? What's that? Did Walt Peck retire? Walt Peck is soon to be retiring. He's, he's declared his retirement date, I think it's sometime this winter, and so, you know, a little bit of a transition where some people are being trained, working up, um, you know, the older, working with the new kind of thing. Hey, but you still have Brian. You still have Brian and um, Karen, don't you, for PIOs? Uh, Brian, Karen, Parker? yeah, and Karen uh, Eubanks. Uh, Karen Eubanks has also declared reti her retirement, and effectively, Cassandra Olvin is moving into her okay. position. Uh, Brian Barker took a job somewhere. I want to say Boulder. Oh, he's gone. gone? Yeah, okay. he is. He's he's no longer no longer with. Uh, he was replaced by Alyssa Coor. Um, what Lisa about Lisa Vadimo? Uh, Lisa Vadimo is still here. Yeah, she's um, central office, I believe. Okay. I think so. I don't know off the top of my head. But if you'd like me to, I could get your your name and number. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I just thought, was wondering if it had been ironed out yet, basically. But a yes or a no. But it sounds I like would no. say. No, but I think it's moving forward in uh, you know an amicable way. Where all right, here's the contract. Let's just work out the nuts and bolts of the of the contract. It was really about money. Uh, it, it did come. It did come down to that. Um, it the, <laughs> what it came down to is uh, the original contract was well, we're serving that area and we're going to get some of the tax dollars versus well, no. We think we're serving that area, and we're going to get the tax dollars. And the people with horns on their collar, like I said, people who have a lot more rank than me, a few more pay grades, they sat down together and figured out what's going to happen. Again, if you want the details, I'll have to pass that on to somebody. Okay. Enough bloody details about South Coast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, going, but I mean, from, from my perspective, from what we do as far as the fire service and emergency medical service, um, I think the service is still going to be fantastic. I don't know how many of you people have had contact with Hillsborough Fire. Great men and women there. I like working with them. I mean, you know, we, they've hired people from our department to work there. I've got 
friends that I've known for years there, they're good people. As well as the medical service is still, it's a county contract provided by Metro West, and Metro West does a, uh, a fantastic job. So as far as coverage is concerned from fire and EMS services, I don't think you're going to see any changes or problems. Just who covers what? Any other questions? One more question. Yes, ma'am. I can take two or three. Or okay. until he says you have three. Okay. Oh, it's regarding our sandbag situation because this last rainstorm uh, was close. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't stopped raining when it did, we would have had problems. So and getting into those is a little bit of a problem right now because something's going on with the dry. Well, no, it's right? pretty much impossible. <laughs> so what she's referring to is on the uh, uh, the northwest parking lot, right be, right on the north side of the Aloha Fire Station, Station 62. We have a uh, sand pile, and we have there's a tire where a whole bunch of the bags. sand bag, bags there to fill it, and one of the nifty bag filler things. So that if you need bags when it comes wet, you can come get sand for free. Go for it. With our own shovel. But you know, you know what though? Get to Until it. recently, there was a shovel that stayed there. I kept on going, nobody's taking that shovel, and it stayed and stayed. So it, it might still be there. I don't know. But anyways, I'll take a look. So what she's talking about is, it's unfortunately these really bad rains came right when we were tearing up the parking lot. We had to, it was old old asphalt. We had to replace it. As we replaced, it, we found a sewer line was cracked, so it became a bigger problem. You know, anytime you remodel a house, you open up the walls. What's yeah. there? That's what we have. And so right now, they're pouring concrete literally as we speak. That's what all the noise is going back and forth there. So uh, within three or four days, as the, when the concrete cures, that problem should go away. If you go, I need sandbags now, like tomorrow morning you can't drive on the concrete, um, you can drive on the side of the road. If you're desperate, knock on the door and say, can I pretty please have a firefighter help this <coughs> smiling lady to get a sandbag? And I bet you a couple guys will come help you. Okay, well, I'm just... What's that? A Santa. A Santa. <laughs> one. One. I think we might need to do more than one. It's like it was. Yeah, I, I think the weather's predicting it's supposed to be a little drier for the next few days. I hope so. Yeah, because I would like that driveway mm -hmm. duck. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to throw out is that I did do a little bit of checking on Butter Electric, and um, there's an awful lot of debris in it, so we could be having a problem. Um, have more rain like that. I saw some big pieces of lumber and stuff like that in it, in several different locations. And when we had this one down in the corner of Oak, the people that were in one of the houses that's on each side of the creek put a whole bunch of bark dust in there, so some of their bark dust went over that way. Because that whole corner flooded. And these two people right here are new neighbors of mine that are right next to the creek and they're learning about it real quickly. And, uh, Did you ask how high the up water went in 1996? No, they haven't seen my picture yet. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> That's supposed to not happen for another 80 <laughs> years. It's 100 years. Yeah, 100 years You're so good for a while. Yeah. Except the other night we were all watching it real close. Yeah. So uh, if we do get more water uh, and the driveway has not been cured, you can uh, park it. It's not a pleasant pleasant spot, but you know that little space of gravel off the side of the road, um, knock on the door and we'll come help you out. Okay. Did you hear that, you guys? Got it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, are you having any problems with exit, entering and exiting, with the increase of traffic in 209, and have you, do you have the ability or can you complain to the traffic, whoever? Handles that area. We don't have a problem entering and exiting because we have lights and sirens, <laughs> and I make people get out of my way. Uh, but as far as like, I've seen cars all the way. Yeah. So. So I don't know. Do you for me, for me, when I when I get off shift in the morning, yeah. I bring my car through the parking lot, go that way. Yeah. <laughs> but I've seen cars because they're waiting for the light mm -hmm. to change. And I think if there's a, you know, if you want to get out, there's no way. I mean, unless you, you decide to topple over. Or right, I don't, I don't disagree with you. In the, I mean, it's, it, it's you know, dur during, rush, during rush hour, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, like I get off shift at seven, I'm out the door, 7.30ish or whatever, and 209th is, is very busy. So 
you know, I can certainly be sympathetic with you and your concerns with the traffic plan, you know, when that area gets the 15, 20, whatever thousand people over there. Uh, 30. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's going to be a significant, um, it, it will be an issue as far as, as traffic. Um, from my perspective, uh, right now it does not affect me much. Mm -hmm. If 10 years from now we have that development and it's still two lanes, it will affect our response times. We won't be able to go as quickly as we would like to. But it will become four lanes at some point as part of the southwest uh, process. I bet it ends up five lanes, well, just guessing. I bet it ends up with five lanes and bike lanes and all that. Only because you I insisted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was not going to be. Oh, really? No, absolutely. Well, I can sympathize with you because I live in the neighborhood right by Bethany Boulevard yeah, when, they, there you go. when they widened that. Yeah. So oh. I'm familiar with that process. <laughs> and I can sympathize with you. Again, working there, I see what you're talking about. It's busy. Yes, sir? Do you have a deal? How do you deal with the train when that comes by? Uh, train, it, it's called the rule of lug nuts. The vehicle with the most lug nuts wins. <laughs> <laughs> train wins. <laughs> so, you know. Sorry. You know. So, uh, you know, in all seriousness, uh, it, there, there's simply nothing we can do. I mean, if I pull out of the station and I know where I'm going, I look up there and I see the train, you know, I can't go past it. If it's, you know, a, say like on the far north side of my response area, I'll get on the radio and just say, hey, can you send uh, the Somerset station, engine 64, because we're, we're, not, not, we're not going. Um, well, that's the way you do it. Is there any way of stopping the train? No. No. <laughs> no. There's no radio contact with it. Nope. Absolutely not. That's no. bad. Well, well, I shouldn't say absolutely none. I mean, if we have an incident on the tracks, uh, our dispatch center has the capability to uh, communicate with uh, the train companies. Or like if we deal with light rail, they have the capability to chat yeah. with uh, to TriMet to let them know, hey, there's, there's a problem on the tracks. But as far as, hey, I, I got to go to a house fire across the train. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do with that. I mean, I'm in the same boat as any other driver in a car. Wow. Love nuts. <laughs> any other questions? I'm going to call time and say, uh, how about some applause? Uh, what I want to do is buy you guys just a couple of seconds to get prepped, and uh, um, I want to uh, welcome somebody else in the room who's trying to look silent and uh, awkward. That's Anna. Uh, Anna is from the Oregonian, and uh, she was very nice to uh, put um, this up for us. Um, a second. She wrote this story about uh, tonight's meeting, which I thought was really neat. So we got some great press, and uh, she, uh, she's been a real friend to the Aloha Library. And uh, uh, the few seconds I'm going to buy as you guys get ready is that uh, I want to announce something that's really neat yeah, happening with the Aloha Library. It's first that Aloha has a library, but Incrementally, we've gone from opening at 12 hours per week, then we went to 15, we kind of kept on nudging up and at 29, but we're about to make the next big leap. And for our, the planning peeps in the room, for a library to get sponsored as this total citizen initiative without the wings of government fluffing along is pretty amazing. But we're about to go to 37 hours per week. That leaves us three hours short of a goal. Washington County Cooperative Library Services basically moved the goalpost on us, good and bad. There was a whole string, a laundry list of conditions that we had to apply or, or abide by in order to be even considered for entry into the Washington County Cooperative Library Services. That's changed. What they did is they raised the number of book checkouts to 40,000 per year. And we're actually probably running about 30,000 a year at 29 hours per week, if you annualize the numbers. So going to 37 leaves us three short of our goal of 40 hours per week. We have to match each open hour with paid staff. So one of the cool things that well, basically made Commissioner Scout and just giddy is that we're paying living wages to the employees that are starting to percolate and fill up those paid hours. And we're doing that on donations only. However, the county on um, uh, October 20th is going to present the library with $15,000 for design for basically our next leap. We probably are going to rapidly outgrow our um, little thousand square feet because we've re-engineered it to put uh, um, 
the 9,000 items we've got for circulation in there, where our target was seven, and we've started changing things around. So um, the, some of the other targets um, just went by the wayside, and looks like we're firing on all cylinders, and probably very rapidly we'll be meeting all the goals to enter or to, to gain acceptance to the Washington County Cooperative Library Service, which would be really neat because that'll like just explode the, the checkouts because you'll be able to pick up and drop off books. That's really the deal breaker right now. She can't do that. But I think it's just really credit to a lot of the hard work. And I really want to thank Anna for some of the stories she's written. She's been a real friend to the library. And uh, um, But with that being said, at straight up 8 o'clock, I want to call some applause for, some, for Hal and Aisha. And thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, again, I'm Hal Bergsma. I'm the uh, planning director for the Colton Hills Park and Recreation District. And Aisha is the deputy director of planning at this point. Uh, so, actually, we maybe eventually we can put the district's website. Up. Oh, no, we do that. Uh, so we, uh, uh, THPRD, uh, uh, serves most of this area except for the retail area. Uh, we basically uh, serve the same area that is covered by the Beaverton School District. A little bit of difference in boundary, but pretty close. Uh, so we, we serve a population of about 230,000 people, uh, covering about 50 square miles. We're the second biggest park provider uh, in the state of Oregon behind the city of Portland. Uh, and we've been in existence since, since the 50s. Uh, we are the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District, not the Tualatin Valley Park and Recreation District. <laughs> get confused about that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little story uh, that relates to some of the stuff that we're doing in this area now. Uh, back in 2006, the Park District decided to update its comprehensive plan. It had, had a plan for a number of years. Uh, in 2006, I was actually working for the city of Beaverton, and so I got involved in that update process as a member of their advisory committee for that process. Uh, and that was a pretty extensive process, and, and as a result of that, they realized that there was a lot to do to uh, bring their facilities up to standard, to provide an adequate number of parks, to provide park coverage uh, throughout the district. Um, and so they concluded that they needed to ask the public for funds to make those improvements. And the best way of doing that is through uh, a bond measure for capital improvements only. That would include land acquisitions as well as improvements such as parks and recreational facilities <coughs> and trails and all that stuff. So they formed another committee to take a look at, well, if we were to go out and ask the voters to approve a bond measure, what would we ask for and how much would we ask for? So there was a fairly extensive process that they went through, and again, I got appointed to represent the city on that committee. Um, and in the end, they concluded that they would ask for $100 million, which is a lot of money for a park district. The last time they had gone out for a bond measure was, we successfully was in 1994, they'd only asked for $14 million. So this is a big jump. Um, yeah. but they looked at the list of things that they thought they needed to do uh, and concluded that that was a reasonable ask. Uh, they also uh, were very specific about the kinds of things that they uh, would be asking for. And there's a, you know, this is something I beat up pretty good. This is a, a list of all the projects that uh, was on the list uh, if the bond measure were to be approved. About a third of the money was to go into land acquisition uh, buying park sites, uh, natural areas, and things like that. We'll get into, that, into the details on that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and then the rest of it, well, most of the rest of it was for capital improvements. Again, improving parks, uh, redeveloping parks, improving trails, adding to various facilities, uh, and so on. Only about 
three percent of that, about three million dollars, was for administrative costs and the cost of selling the bonds and, and so on. So almost all of it went to either acquisitions or capital improvements. Mm -hmm. So they uh, did quite a bit of uh, research before they uh, had the election in November of 2008 and uh, did some polling uh, to see what people wanted uh, to spend the money on. Uh, uh, a lot of people were interested in protecting natural areas and uh, building trails, although there's still a lot of support for various kinds of recreational facilities. One of the things that we uh, did uh, ask about, asked the voters about was what if we built a, uh, a community center or what we also call a recreation aquatic center to serve what we call the southwest quarter quadrant of the park district which includes this area and the polling indicated because those are fairly expensive about 30 to 40 million dollars that people were not sure they wanted to pay that much money for just one facility so that facility was uh, taken off a list of things that were, was to be paid for with the uh, bond major funds. We instead just decided we we're going to buy a site, but not build a facility at this point. So in the end, we came up with a specific list, uh, and we put it on the ballot in November of 2008. And you may recall what happened about that time. We, the economy took a nosedive. We were polling earlier in the year had shown support by about 62, 63% of voters. Uh, we squeaked by and it passed about 51 to 49%. The majority did support it. So we were authorized to sell the bonds, uh, which we did in two phases uh, in the early 2009 and then uh, again later in that year. So two issuances, and because of the state of the economy at that time, we got the bonds at a very good interest rate, we saved money, we were able to uh, reduce the uh, tax rate that we had to levy to pay for the bonds. Uh, so it was a really good deal. One of the things I think that really sold uh, the voters on the bond measure, besides the fact that we were very specific about how we were going to spend the money, uh, was that we said that we're going to have a very transparent uh, process for spending the money and that we're going to have a group of uh, well-qualified citizens uh, to oversee the spending of that money. And Anthony uh, here tonight is a member, has been since the beginning. Yes. Has been since the beginning. Uh, no. Oh, it, it was a year after. It was a year after, that's right. Almost the beginning. Uh, we uh, appointed an oversight committee of uh, local citizens, uh, uh, people with professional backgrounds uh, in accounting, uh, lawyers, uh, former mayor of Beaverton, people like that, uh, one of the assistant county administrators uh, who uh, meet quarterly to get reports on how the money is being spent, review uh, uh, accounts, uh, uh, accounting report, and so on. They uh, put out an annual report on their view of how the money is being spent. I think the fourth one is coming out here uh, soon. Uh, those are available on the district's website. So, uh, and I think the the members of the bond over system bond oversight committee have been pleased with the way things have gone. Uh, we certainly have been able to on the acquisition side. Since that's a side I, I get involved in quite a bit. Uh, by more land than we had uh, uh, anticipated, so we've exceeded our objectives at, at that end. Uh, so we think generally it's been going pretty good. There's always a few bumps in the road. There's always a few projects that run into a few problems and uh, cost a bit more than we think it will going in. Uh, but generally we've made a lot of progress. So what I want to talk about in a little more detail is what we're doing in this area in terms of that bond program. Uh, we'll just have a little bit of a handout here, uh, a little map that shows uh, what's going on in this area. We'll just go around for you into the details. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll start talking about right now before you get these is you may have seen information 
uh, in the media about uh, an agreement that the park district entered into with the Beaverton School District uh, earlier this year. Uh, this relates to building a community park right next to, in fact, on part of the school grounds for Mountain View Middle School uh, on Farmington Road. Uh, this resulted from, I guess, some luck <laughs> in a way. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the map I just passed around, there, there's, uh, you can see where Southwest Community Park is, sort of right in the middle. Uh, you look a little bit to the uh, west of that on the south side of Farmington, it says Future Park. Originally, we had a, a plan to build a new community park on that site, and what we determined is that it had a few problems. One, it was a bit on the small side. It was about 10 acres. Typically, you want to see a community park on a site of closer to uh, 15 or 20 acres. And this site also has a small stream uh, running through it. That meant we were going to have to deal with relocating the stream and, and doing something about that, which can be challenging. Uh, while we were looking for neighborhood park sites in the area, we uh, realized there was land right to the south of and behind uh, Mountain View Middle School that was for sale. It was close to a park we already owned, Lawndale Park. And, and then we discovered there was another piece of property that was actually uh, part of the school site that they weren't using, a nice forested site. Uh, and then we started thinking, well, maybe we could work out something with the school district where we can make some major improvements to the fields on, on their site, as well as adding the land that we have and put together uh, a, a really nice community park. In this case, it's going to be about 20 acres uh, and really have some nice synthetic turf fields, natural grass fields, uh, natural areas, good, a good parking setup. Uh, play areas, tennis courts, all the stuff that goes with a community park, and really have a great park for this area. And so that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, we had already put money in the budget under the bond program, uh, about uh, seven and a half million dollars to improve the park. We've actually added a bit more money through uh, interest earnings and other sources, and uh, now we're uh, getting ready to start the planning process for this park that should be kicking off here early next year. Uh, we're just about to release a request for proposal for consulting assistance and uh, we hope to have that park completed by 2018 at the latest, possibly 2017, depending on how things go. So that's, that's a big event for this area. That's the biggest investment that the Park District is making in this area right now. So let me talk about some of the other things that are going on. Uh, any questions about that particular project? I had just a comment, because this area really lacks like outdoor water parks. Most of my friends uh -huh. that have elementary school kids, we go to Hillsboro to the 53rd Street Park during the summertime when we actually get sun mm -hmm. in Oregon. It would sure be nice to have something similar. So are you talking a pool or more like no, a splash pad sort of? Yeah, okay. yeah, because that's really, we're traveling from Beaverton to Hillsboro to access. Well, I wish I could tell you we're going to have something like that. In Just the on the wish list down the road. Probably not, but, but we are, we did put a splash pad uh, at our uh, Conestoga Recreation and Aquatic Center, uh, opened that up uh, last right, year. Why? But it's you have to pay to go. Yeah, that, that is something. And we're also going to have the Beaverton these. Library. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But I mean, you go to Hillsborough Park, right. that park, and it's packed. We're also going to have days. a splash pad. Uh, we're going to be redeveloping our Cedar Hills Park uh, up in North Beaverton. Okay. Uh, and that's going to have a splash pad as well. Yeah, cause just uh, I see the high demand when you go to yeah. that park in Hillsborough. Now, when we finally find funds to build a uh, community center in this area, uh, that would probably be an element of that. That's some kind of a splash. But it's not going to happen real soon. No, no, I wasn't counting. 
Okay. One more thing, by the way, about the uh, the what we're calling right now, because we don't have a real name for it, the, our, our Southwest Quadrant Community Park, uh, is one of our objectives is to get some uh, funding assistance from uh, private sources to build uh, what we're calling a Champions Two field. Uh, and that's a field for various sports, baseball as well as other sports, uh, with uh, synthetic turf and, and other uh, Americans with Disability Act uh, uh, compatible facilities uh, to serve uh, basically the whole region. Uh, it's something that you don't find in this area. It's going to cost probably over a million dollars to, to build that kind of facility. We're not sure of the exact cost at this point because we're still working on what, what it's going to include. Uh, but that uh, is hopefully going to be part of that project, and, and we should be starting a fundraising campaign uh, for that part of the project uh, here early next year. Where would that be located? It'll, that'll be part of the uh, community park behind Mountain Dew. Behind Mountain Dew. One thing to add about that also is uh, the Southwest Community Park, the funding for that park um, was also, uh, it was largely TH PRD, but it was also a partnership with Beaverton right. School District. Um, and in addition, there were some funds transferred by Washington County to TH PRD to aid in the purchase of land at the Southwest Quadrant Community Park site. So there's there's been a lot of partnerships so far. We expect a lot more in the future and this um, capital fundraising will enroll out in January. For sure. So let's just talk about what's on the map here a little bit. Maybe going from, uh, well, let's go from sort of south to north on the map. So uh, one of the things that's included in this area sort of on the uh, eastern edge of CPO6 is uh, work on three segments of the Waterhouse Regional Trail. You can see those dark bars there. There's one that runs between uh, Barrows Road and Schultz Ferry Road. That's under construction now. In fact, just last week it was. We placed a big 152-foot bridge. bridge across in Summer Creek in that pieces. area. Wow. And they started from one end, and they were very happy to that get gosh. within an inch of where they needed to be on the other end. Uh -huh. Just before the big rainstorm, so just, just in time. And it's and, still there. And it's going to get washed away. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's that's pretty substantial. And uh, so that'll be a big part of that project. Uh, we'll be paving the trail here uh, in the next few weeks, and that should be opening up pretty quickly. We've already paved the next segment to the north uh, between Weir and I forget the street at the north end. But, so we took some of the streets off the map because it was getting too uh, cluttered. Uh, and then the, the, that's segment four of the trail, and then segment seven uh, goes over Mount Williams. Uh, pretty steep in there, but we have paved that. Uh, and if you drive uh, by Shehalem Elementary School and look to the south, you'll see this thing coming down the slope. And the bridge. There's a bridge that doesn't go across a creek, it goes across a... Uh, uh, Giant gas line. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. And so they just wanted to make sure we weren't touching it. To not to blow it up. And so, so what's this trail we, costing to finish uh, this? The total cost is... It's I mean, that's by Shahalen there. That's, that's pretty fancy there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, money, I don't have a lot of money out in this spreadsheet. It's, it's uh, I believe, a couple million dollars. So it's between the three segments. And that includes the engineering, uh, design work, construction work, and so on. So it's, it's not inexpensive, especially when you have some challenging topography. We also had to spend some money on acquisition of easements and uh, it's only going to cost and, Couple million go the whole length of the district? Uh, no, just those three short segments. Yeah. That's what it costs. Yeah. What's well, going to cost for the rest of the? Well, the rest of them rest are there. The rest of those are there and out. So we're filling gaps in, in an existing trail. So once we get those three segments done, you can go all the way from Barrows Road all the way up to the Nature Park. It's a distance of about five miles. 
How much is it on streets? Uh, very short. Uh, there's a little bit uh, over by uh, just south of TD Highway where you have to jog uh, over onto a street to get across TD Highway. Then right after you cross, you get back on the trail. Uh, what nature park is oh, up here? Oh, yeah. yeah, the Nature Park uh, north of the Paul Valley Highway. And there's also a project on the north end of that that is a link that'll get you from the Merlot Station on 158th and uh, south of Jenkins over to the Waterhouse Trail. And on the Waterhouse Trail, you can continue all the way up for a little bit. There's a gap there, but eventually you're going to be able to get all the way up to the Rock Creek Greenway Trail at the north end of the district. Right. And actually, you can get up to Springmore Road, which will take you over to PCC Rock Creek. So uh, it's about going to be about 10 miles. We're completing some uh, gaps in the Waterhouse Trail right now. It's under construction. The, the, seg the segment that links those two trails, Waterhouse and West Side, should be done in the next couple of years. So it'll be a fairly long trail uh, shortly. What type of amenities is the Barsoti Park off of? Um, yeah. Have. Well, let me let me let me sort of go from south to north, and we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. So that's that's the big trail project in this area. Uh, also, in uh, bold print there, uh, right at the top of Cooper Mountain, we had the grand opening ceremony just in the last month or so, and mm -hmm. Eric was there uh, taking pictures. Uh, is uh, Paul and Vernon Winkleman Park? This is a community park. Uh, this was the first phase of that park. Uh, it's about 20 acres, and so we built uh, a field there, a uh, grass field that well drained, and, and uh, also a dog park, which is very popular. And a pet track around the field. Yep, yep, a pet track around the field, and a, a parking lot. In this case, it's a gravel parking lot right now because we're outside the urban growth boundary there. So we'll eventually complete that project, uh, pave the parking lot, put in more amenities, but we're just getting started there. Uh, going to the north, uh, we've acquired a two-acre site uh, on uh, just uh, near Hazeldale uh, Elementary School, just up the road there for a, for a neighborhood park. Neighborhood parks typically are two to five acres of size, so this is going to be a bit small, but this is, we think, a pretty good size. It's relatively flat, given the topography. This is right on Miller Hill Road. Uh, and so this is an area that was underserved, didn't have uh, uh, a lot of parks. Of course, you have a little bit of amenity at Hazeldale Elementary, but of course, that's closed to public use during school hours. Uh, talked a bit about Southwest. Community Park. Uh, we also acquired uh, another uh, neighborhood park site at the corner of 165th and Farmington, the northeast corner. Uh, that's about a six acre site. Half that's wetland, so about uh, half of it's going to be available for active park use. And uh, again, there's no funding to construct the park. That will have to be probably a, a future bond major or possibly other sources of funding. And just a bit to the east of that, we've acquired uh, some land with the assistance of a grant from Metro to expand Lily K. Johnson Woods Natural Area. So we're working on uh, adding to that natural area and opening it up for uh, some trail use and, and so on. Uh, I mentioned before that we had thought about possibly asking for funds in the last bond measure, the 2008 bond measure, for a community center for the area. We decided not to do that, but we did decide to put money into the measure to acquire a site for that. And so we have acquired a potential community center site uh, just to the west of our existing Arnold Park, which is, of course, contiguous to the International School of Beaverton. Uh, we actually bought uh, an access point to that site, which is about six acres a few years ago, right uh, to the north of the existing uh, uh, funeral home uh, on the east side near Pike Street. And uh, so this uh, property, which has a house on it, we're running it out right now, will provide access to this larger property 
We're not sure if that's going to be the site because we also might consider using the site that we didn't use for the community park on the south side of Farmington. It's going to be one of those two. Uh, we haven't decided yet uh, where it's going to go. Uh, going a little bit to the east of that, uh, we recently acquired a, uh, an, another natural area on the north side of TB Highway at, near the intersection with 153rd to expand the Beaver Creek wetlands a little bit, basically about half a pond. Is parking? Uh, no, oh. not yet. It's, it's probably not going to be actively used uh, because it's, it's basically there for people to observe, but you really can't get into it. To get there to observe it, I mean to walk through the right. It's it's, it's 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 there's probably going to be, be a need for some additional trails in that area. So, uh, yes, yes, sir. Now, looking at your boundaries on uh, Cripple Mountain Nature Park across mm -hmm. the street from my house, uh, what, what is your future plan for the white area over there? Is that more expansion of uh, the nature park? White area to the south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is just a jurisdictional boundary. The park is north, the north part, the yellow, is inside the urban growth boundary. And the white outside is rural land. And this is a park that's owned by Metro and operated by THP or ACE. So the, the whole green, area, right? the whole green yes. is Met the park. Metro owns the, the park and we operate it through an intergovernmental agreement. Right. So it, it benefits both parties. Uh, and of course, as, as you note, that part of that area is white. Uh, that means that it's outside the district boundaries. And the parts that are, uh, you know, show the urban growth boundary on this map, that part of the urban area uh, on Cooper Mountain is not within the park district at this point. We certainly welcome people to annex if they want to. We have an annual annexation program, but there is a cost, obviously, when you into the park district, uh, your taxes are going to go up about a dollar seventy-four per thousand. I think it is right now. Uh, so that that's a consideration. Right. So Varsody Park uh, and uh, Varsody Park. You had a question about that? Just because I'm excited because it's in Aloha, not too far from my house. What amenities are going to be developed at that? Place? Well, that is a neighborhood park. Uh, so you've probably seen the construction going on there right now? Mm -hmm. I'm on the north side of TV Highway. Oh, okay. okay, well, uh, I, I drove by there actually the other way here this evening, and uh, there's still quite a bit going on. They've uh, basically graded out the fields. They've planted grass there. There are gonna, There's going to be a multi-purpose field, uh, baseball, I believe, primarily, but I think it'll ask for other sports as well. There's going to be a, a play area. There's going to be a community garden, uh, which are in Renan. Um, there's, yeah, uh, I believe there's going to be a tennis court. Um, that's on Bland, right? It is. Between 170th and 170. So just between uh, 165th okay. and, uh, and 170th. Mm -hmm. So this is a site that we had acquired several years ago, and we held on to it in anticipation. We received funding eventually to make the improvement, and when we passed the bond measure, we had that funding, and so now we're, we're building it. It should be done by the end of the year, open to the public, so it's going to be close uh, to be able to use it. And let's see, so going on north, uh, we also have acquired a site uh, in sort of the Ilmonica light rail station area. Uh, that's labeled Future Park, and uh, that's about six acres or so. It's sort of on the periphery of that high density area around the white rail station. They are really in need of a park site. Again, we don't have funds yet to build it out, but we think it's a good location. It's not your typical park site in that there's a stream running sort of diagonally through it, but uh, uh, it's going to be a combination of a uh, park for active recreational use as well as, as, a, as a natural area. So we're excited to have that. Okay, and I should note that we're not done yet in terms of acquiring uh, land for parks in this area. We actually have another site that we're close to closing on. Uh, this would be north of TV Highway and east of 185th, where we hope to put a, uh, a soccer field. You know, there's a big demand for uh, field space in this area. 
and so we have funds uh, under the bond measure actually to build a field now. We just needed a site to put it on, and so we will acquire that site and then shortly thereafter start building the field there. Uh, and then we're also pursuing acquisition of a neighborhood park site north of Tevia Highway and west of 185th in an area that really isn't served by a, a neighborhood park at this point. And we hope to have that acquired here in the next six months or so. So quite a bit going on, quite a bit of money being spent. And uh, for the four questions? I'm open for questions, yes. I'll start with one. I'm going to pull rank. Yes. <laughs> um, 10x Woods Future Natural Area. Yes. Um, best guess on timeline on when you can work on that, like three, five years, uh, well. 10 years? Or are you just, are you just like buy and hold until South Cooper Mountain starts kicking in? So this is, this is sort of where I come in because I'm, I'm new to the district. I'm there, I've been there two months now, but uh, we came in at, I came in at a really good point because we just completed this comprehensive plan update for the district. And one of the things that that comprehensive plan told us was that we need to figure out a functional plan, an action plan for parks. So we've done this great work with the tax funds that we've got, the bond funds that we've gotten to go out and acquire land and to build parks that were already vacant or needed redevelopment. Um, but we've got a bunch of land that's now been land banked and we are going to undertake a park functional plan exercise where we figure out where we need to go to build out the rest of those parks. So we will come up with prioritization criteria and come up with a, a plan for how we're going to take the properties that we've got and actually if they're vacant build on them, if they will reach the end of their useful life, how we find funds to redevelop those lands. So that's, that's a piece that's to come. We're gonna, we're gonna try to get through this last year or two of the construction for the bond projects, but while we're doing that, we're gonna be developing this functional plan so that we can prioritize the, uh, the park lands that we need to develop going forward. Quick follow up, yes or no, is um, the annexation of South Cooper Mountain automatically put that land, 546 acres, into THPRD district, or is that a separate track for that to be brought into THPRD? <laughs> That's a separate track. Yeah, it's a separate track. I'll, I'll speak as a uh, former bureaucratic planner, okay. so I'm familiar with the regulations. Uh, they have <clears throat> uh, a section of their development code that does say that uh, at the time development uh, is approved, uh, the project, development project has to annex into the park district unless the developer can demonstrate that they can provide a similar level of service. I don't think anybody can demonstrate that, but there is that opening. So it'll happen incrementally as that area develops, just as it's happening incrementally in the North Bethany area now, okay. where the county says before you can receive uh, development approval, you have to annex all the designated service providers for that area, including the park district. Getting back to 10X Wood just real quickly, uh, that is actually not a park, that's a natural area. And so we received funds uh, in part from Metro to help buy that. So that will not be developed. It might be improved a little bit with trails for people to access the site, but that will not be uh, a site for active recreation. Fantastic, thank you. Well, one more thing before we go on. Uh, Eric, if you could click on 2008 bond measure real quick and maybe schedule an update, sir, over there. So that's a list of all the different projects we have going on in different categories, park additions, upgrades, National Area Preservation, if you want to scroll on down, uh, trail expansions, uh, that lists some of the trails we just mentioned, athletic field additions, uh, various uh, building expansions and improvements. One of those listed there at the top is Aloha Swim Center. Uh, we made some improvements there, put in uh, family dressing rooms. It also, uh, as you might have noticed, expanded the parking lot with uh, uh, permeable paving. Clean that for the dogs in the pool? Well, the, yeah, just that's a one-time thing. Whenever we drain, we, we just started to practice when we drain the pool uh, <clears throat> for work, uh, which we did occasionally, we first. said, what the heck, let's let the dogs yeah. go swimming before we, we drain the water out. So, pretty popular. Yeah, it has been very popular. We just did it at Beaverton uh, Pool as well. 
Uh, so you can see all the various facility improvements and there's maintenance replacement. So it's a long list of projects that the money's being spent uh, for a whole bunch of things throughout the park district. So other questions? Um, I don't want to go into any particular park here, but is it possible? Who do you talk to? Like if you have a real genuine concern and it requires discussion with a planner or whatever your title is. I mean, do you have a staff or do I call it? What kind with? of issue? Like a design issue? Oh, a like you have one issue? thing here that's always been called a, it was called a park and it's really just, it was a drainage ditch and then it was kind of a swale and now somebody finally caught it and it became a wetland, but it all occurred when a, one of these huge developments occurs where there's no land, there's right. these big houses, and we had a ton of them at the end of the farm block, so two and a half acres, and they put 43 houses on it. And as a part of doing that, they had to have it. Had to have it. So across it, they wanted, there was supposed to be a park within so much proximity, a neighborhood park. Arnold would be the closest one. And so I had the plans, actually, from the old CPO, and, and it was signed off because Fulton Valley, Fulton North Parks and Rec has to sign off on all developments, I guess. It, it passes muster and whatever they have to do. And it was signed by a temporary worker. He signed it temporary worker. And so this thing up here that's called Scott Place Wetlands is just a, not really, probably as big as this table. Got a fence around it. Well, it's and every bad. summer I call because the weeds and the fence. Well, not only <laughs> that, yeah, it's bad, but, but but because we're unincorporated, there's a guy with fifth wheels decided it's a great place to park, and so he parks one fifth wheel on one side, and then it goes on a corner, and his other fifth fifth wheel is there. And I mean, it's dangerous. The fence is falling in. It's a, it would be a terrible place for a child or for, you know, it just is this deep kind of off. That means to have a semi-truck parking next to it that broke the sidewalk for a period of time. Yeah, and, and, but the idea is that I haven't said anything for years, should have, sorry, you know, it's whatever. I think you're talking to the right people. But I just thought there's some other issues that might be of interest to you in that area as I've done a lot of checking with the county and what the future plans are and stuff like that. And I thought it was time for some discussion and I wanted to be a part of that if I could or at least make you aware of it. I don't know how the county and um, the park district interchange when it comes to building new, having new developments and stuff like that and, and it turns out they probably made a little bit of a transportation mistake. And matter of fact, they did. I found out through the other thing. And, and so in order to talk to you about maybe any potential park, I guess if it's zoned for future development for infill, then does that just automatically screw you guys out? I mean, do you just look it up and say, oh, well, the county's already got this plan for you know, housing, so we can't even think about that area. Do you mean whether it could be a park? Uh-huh. Oh, well, all the land that the district buys has some sort of land designation or zoning on it. So but what if they haven't yet and the county's already designated it for something else? Down most the of the land that is parks has been designated as something other than parks. Oh. So the park district is a buyer just like anyone else. If we can get someone to agree on a price, we can buy it. Well, do I go to your board meetings or to make an appointment with can, one of you? You can talk to us. You can talk to us. Do you have a business? Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, that location as a wetlands is, is a natural area. We went through a process a couple of years ago where we recognized that all these places we call parks were not all so you parks. revisited that. Yeah, and and so we reclassified a lot of them from parks to natural areas and we basically said they're not going to be developed for active recreation. Yeah. And uh, that's probably one of the examples well, that we do. For a long time it was, cons it was named a park and then they yeah, changed it. Was it was a park and name only, yeah. Did the staff go and check on these so-called wetland parks? Because the last two or three years, every summer, I have to get on the phone and say, do you know your blackberries are now across the sidewalk into the street? The fence is falling apart. 
this we last have, time it took staff. about a month. Yeah, we have, we staff. have staff at the district, natural resources okay. staff. They but it took me this that. last time for, it took about a month and I had to keep emailing back and no one seemed to know who was in charge of it. Well, we should be able to respond better than that. Yes. Um, so let's just we, but as Aisha said, we do have a, a natural resources section that's responsible for managing all the natural areas. Just um, every summer I have to call lot, on it. It's a big area to cover and they rely uh, in some cases on volunteer help to put together work parties to go out and deal with those kinds of things. Oh. But, but uh, they try to keep track of those things, and if you're having a problem, we can certainly let you know. But I mean, I guess if you could pass that on, because I, sure. as a citizen, every summer call on that. Is it this particular one? It's in this Scott Place? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And they still we haven't fixed that. the fence. The fence is well, broken. That's part of what I think is dangerous. Right. We will get your contact information, and uh, we'll also get a little bit. Thank you. Across the street from us. <laughs> Um, I, I had a question about the kind of follow-up to Eric's question about the South Cover Mountain <clears throat> soon to be urban area and your cooperation with in the planning in that. But before I ask that, I wanted to point out that 30 some years ago, Hal worked for the county and was the planner. Not really. He was our principal planner. He wasn't a principal planner at the time, I don't believe. But he was the one that put together the Aloha Reedville Cooper <coughs> Mountain Community Plan and worked with us for years until its adoption. In fact, 30 years ago, this it's month or next year. month or something. Yeah. Right, that's right. Long time ago. Long history wow. in this area. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So, congratulations, thank you. Yeah, we owe him, you know, our community plan. Basically. Well, we thought it was going to be implemented a lot sooner. But, <laughs> 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 but anyhow, for my follow up question on Eric's South Cooper Mountain, are you working with the city of Beaverton to locate parks within yes. that area as the planning process? Good. Yeah, they're, they're their provider. Right? I know, but you're, you're they're not until, eventually. until they oh. annex. Well, generally, that's what I meant. When they're in the city well, no, recognizes. Not automatically, though. I think so. You know, the city yeah. recognizes THPRD as the parks provider for the city. Right. And they have a few facilities that they own themselves, such as the park next to the library and so on. But most of the parks in the city are THPRD parks. But did, you, you said it didn't automatically come in just because... Well, that's that's because that's the way they set it up. Now, there it may be some time in the future, after I leave, uh, <laughs> that uh, we'll get uh, the city to do what they've done with uh, Fall and Light Fire and Rescue, which is they annex to uh, the park district, and then that means that when the city annexes property, that uh, it automatically comes in the park district, just as that happens with PBF&R now. Uh, but until that happens, we're in a different situation. Uh, but at least, you know, they're, they are going to be requiring uh, annexation to the park district as, as the area develops. Good. And, and how sat on that technical advisory committee for the district? I'm now representing the district there. And we, um, we commented on the three draft scenarios that are out now, and if you haven't seen them, they're on the city's website. Um, and I provided quite a lot of feedback. There, there were some decisions made about park locations that we questioned, and they were very responsive to that. And um, so, you know, we've we've been raising our issues and pointing out what the district's needs and desires are, so that they can be considered as part of that plan. So it'd be pretty dense. Very yes. pretty dense, yeah. Of course, they're planning for <coughs> more than just the area within the UGB. They're planning for the entire <coughs> South Cooper Mountain area. Uh, some of that area, the urban reserve area, uh, may not come into the urban growth boundary for years, but uh, we're still interested in that. We're also working with uh, Metro to try to expand uh, the Cooper Mountain Nature Park. You know, we are pursuing some annexations in that area, or, or excuse me, some acquisitions in that area. I have another question. Um, how often do you guys do anything with Bales? Bales Bridgeway, Bridge Park, Nature Park, whatever you want to call it. Right. Well, Bales Wetlands. Wetlands. The wetlands uh, doesn't obviously get a lot of attention because it's not used actively, but if, if there's a need for maintenance, removal of invasive species like blackberries, that's something that we can jump in and drive. Um, what I'd like to do is articulate a few of your concerns. Um, there's Bales uh, Wetlands has had this problem. 
we've kind of set the expect or set up uh, foreshadowed Butternut Creek as a problem, which is a contributor to flooding with that area. In addition to that, um, poor Sandy here has had to go through jurisdictional messes in order to figure out at what point on Farmington Road is somebody doing maintenance. And at the county, there's been ping pong with um, you know the state. It's a state facility, but the state's out of money, so we're stepping up. Uh, we are doing it because the state's got money right now, and then we're not, and it's, oh my God, we're doing it. You know, beavers, or is it Nutria? You know, uh, hiring, you know, multiple jurisdictions going out to hire uh, uh, vector control and, uh, you know, critter, critter con containment uh, to deal with uh, uh, blockages of, uh, of beaver dams. And so there's layers of issues, and then there's vector control from Washington County doing mosquito control. I go on mm -hmm. and on. So that's kind of the short form. So what I want to do is escalate uh, Bill's wetlands, um, just because it's right behind the cool new little library, as a, an area where, boy, a footbridge? It'd be nice to get people out there looking at it. We could also get the scuba divers out there quicker to <laughs> unplug the drains. It'd just be an old area I'd like to escalate on your radar and attention for a little, little bit of love and TLC because Aloha, according to Clean Water Services, is behaving like a bathtub, and that's one of the many plugs that we need to keep unplugged so the bathtub drains. Is that? That is correct. Okay. And there are beaver dams galore in there. Really? Absolutely. Oh, Go to Susan them. Maria Apartments, drive into the back part, and look down the creek, and you'll oh, see a know. huge one that's with water so backed up that if it comes loose, or if it or if it backs up, we're all in big trouble. See the dams you want to be. Yeah. You want all the beavers? We saw the beavers the other day. They did. Right by my house. Was it earlier or late in the day? Late, like early evening. Yeah. I think that's when you're most likely to see them. You know, if you charge a fish, well, maybe you'd have plenty to. I went on a tour with our natural resources superintendent last week. He took me to a similar situation at the Center of Security and Wetland in the main part of Beaverton. And they have quite a beaver issue going on right there. And then almost as quickly as they can pull the dams down, the guys are back at it. So I'll, I'll share this particular one later on. There are things that I've learned 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 that i have 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 it's a challenge to try to do it. Where exactly are you referring to? To the beavers? Uh, yeah, the creek. Uh, the it's right the, there, the big dam that you can see is in the back part of the Susan Marie Departments right off of, it's back behind the Rosa. Yeah, it's Rosa. Go down Rosa and then you turn oh. down that street before you get to um, Division and uh, Madeline. First, before that, they're first in street there. on the right. Yeah, but it's and looking into Bales Wetlands. Is that right? No, yeah. you can't. No, you don't see that one from Bales. You oh. can see just a lot of junk in Bales that's gathering because it's coming down there and getting in that wetland. But down farther than that, where you can't see, because the ODOT man went through there and looked for me, and he said there was at least four dams. And then he told me about the big one at Susan Marie, in which I've been watching. And it's a big one. If you want to go and see a big beaver dam, <laughs> can you relocate beavers within the same area so that we keep the creek open and give them their own little area? We have a lady talk to us about that. Yeah. 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 Ye
turn, yeah, right I'm turn, just, yeah. they're going to do damage. It's wet. It all just look, you know, something that comes up. Notice if you just look at it, it's all always no simple answers. Right. Turn right. That we right. know that there's a bunch of stuff. That's why I keep saying that. Let's do something. They may be simple, but there's not the right answer. Yeah. The American Indians use bigger testicles as a headache remedy because they weren't as you never see it. All right. Yeah. One last question. Got one right here. Speaking of furry creatures, there's the cougar on Cooper Mountain in the Nature Park area. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I'm not aware there was a cougar up there. I heard about bobcats up there. But, uh, there's a couple bobcats. There's a really bad guy in the world. Take you out. There's mostly a cougar walking around. That's, so, that's news to me. There's some big prints in my pasture the other day. Wow. But they have quite a range. Yeah, a big range. They don't run 30 miles. Bob, do you want to take the last question? Well, I was going to say there's cougar in the nature park, too, because my neighbors have seen them. Mm -hmm. Really? In the oh, Cooper Mountain? Here, kitty, 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 kitty. When they're on 170th. Really? Oh, wow. Well, the Cooper yeah. Mountain yeah. School. Yes, there are. Wow. Deer, deer, deer. I'm just surprised well, I know there's either. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just, I'm just well, saying. Well, my neighbors have seen them. A sure. I was in my driveway the other day and said, have you seen the cougar? And I said, I haven't seen them yet. Well, if you see them, we should. Then you said. Okay. <laughs> what do the Indians use those for? Well, I don't want to know. Uh, I, I think, Bob, just real quick. What? You were talking about this new building that they were talking about. This article on Twalton Hills that was in Oregonia a couple weeks ago uh, by this uh, yeah, uh, assessment done on the count on your projects and stuff. Um, we talked about an 18,000 square foot adventure park. Is that something separate you're talking about, or is this something? That is. That is not something that uh, comes under the bond program, uh, or that would be paid for. Uh, well, it, 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 we might provide some seed money, but, but basically, it's not anything that comes under the bond program. Uh, it's something that would be a sort of an entrepreneurial thing. Uh, and they're talking whatever, about whatever rock it costs, climbing, laser yeah, tag, whatever it costs is going to be paid for hard. By, by whatever revenues we get from that. So it's, it's not, we're basically trying to cater to younger folks that generally don't use our facilities as much. Uh, people in the, maybe the 18 to 34 age range who are more interested in those kinds of sports. What would a facility like that cost to build? We're not talking about building one. We're talking about renting space and, and uh, making improvements to it. We're not talking about uh, building a new building or buying land for it. The hope is that that, that particular facility would be self-supporting. It's right. entrepreneurial. It would be something that is not paid for by operating fees of the district. Um, and I don't know if they're still so looking, the but they wouldn't be involved it, it wouldn't be a no. taxpayer-funded enterprise. It would be a separate enterprise fund run through the district, but the cost recovery would have to be full, a full cost recovery. They were recruiting for people on an advisory committee. I don't know if they had a deadline that's noted there, but they were looking for representatives between 18 and I think 35. So if you know anyone who is into extreme sports and wants to do high wire ropes course and some things like that, zip lines, that's what they're, that's what they're yeah, looking for. One of the biggest sports in the state is mountain biking. And, and that was a, in the original board, in Cooper Mountain Park, they were going to do some trails for mountain biking, some trails for equestrian. Really? Because of the room is there. <laughs> well, it's, it's, apparently that did not, I'm not sure what happened there, but that's not a side. But we are actually, we have talked about uh, a mountain biking park somewhere in this area. We just haven't gotten very far in those discussions. But we are considering that. That being said, I got a call for some applause. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Up next, Lyles Garcia. Give us an update on what's going on in the mailbox. You guys can probably hear me from the back of the room here. Don't come on up. You're on camera. I'm doing a TV show here today.
we have, um, I'll tell you about one neighborhood meeting that we had last week, and we've got a couple more neighborhood meetings coming up, and we've got one application. Um, last Wednesday on September 25th, there was a neighborhood meeting for five uh, single family houses at 19740 Southwest Marlin Drive. That's right across the street from Hazelfield School to the, to the east, if you're familiar with that area. Um, and I'm sure we'll probably have the, uh, the application and the public notice will be coming, coming from that. Um, on October the 16th, there's going to be a neighborhood meeting for the property on uh, Bales Thriftway Complex. I'm guessing where the former video store used to be. It's, it's vacant right now. There's going to be a McDonald's. Oh, good place. Right by the beer. Well, that's what uh, Vicki and I were talking about that. And my wife and I were talking about that too. About how the Dairy Queen and McDonald's are going to be like, you know, across the, sort of across the street. But that's a done deal? Yeah. Uh, this is a neighborhood meeting. Um, depending on maybe some market conditions and economic conditions, that at, at this stage, it, it's preliminary. Just like you know, there's going to be a Walgreens on the corner of 190, 185th and Farmington. Well, that hasn't started yet. Right. And we've had the neighborhood meeting and the application process has probably been a year now. That is allowed started. in that zone, though. What? Uh, McDonald's is allowed yeah. in that zone. Um, we had Dairy Queen. Oh, oh, yeah. oh well, no, there, it was a Hollywood video before, so it's sure. probably... Uh, let me see. Oh, it's community business district, yeah. which is what the whole complex there is. Yeah. So there should be no zoning, right? So no zoning no, issues. Yeah. I can imagine the traffic is going to draw. Oh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> well, you just go from uh, go to McDonald's, get your meal, and go to Dairy Queen to get your dessert. Just take one. Why do you have to go over there when it's three thirty in the afternoon? No, don't, don't go. Go, go over there. Don't go over there. Well, I mean the kids and everything. Oh yeah. Yeah. Don't yes. go there then. Well, you don't even pay attention. You almost hit them because they're talking on their stupid phones. <laughs> you can look at it in a couple of ways. It might be like a plus for Aloha because, you know, they see maybe more business here and they were growing and had, had another uh, business. Another neighborhood meeting is um, at 2066-5 Southwest Johnson. That's about a couple blocks to the east of the um, Reedville School. And that's going to be for, that's going to be a 23 lot subdivision. And the meeting will be on October 17th at the Reedville Presbyterian Church, which is, that's the one right next door to the school, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It'll be a 6.30, um, 6.30 in the evening. How big of a piece is that? That's what? How, many, how big is that piece that's going to have the 23? It's not. It's not Probably on the neighborhood. Not on the neighborhood meeting, but it, it's about huh? it, about three acres. Yeah, it's probably three or four acres. Oh, there there might be, be a large lot. Oh, in there's there somewhere. not that much room over there. Yeah, behind the brick house is probably. It's on the north side. Do you know where the, the water north, tower is? On the north oh, side yeah. of Johnson. No, the north side of Johnson's. No, the water tower is two sixteenth or something like that. The water tower is on the north right side right of Alexander School. But no, this is just east of Reedville School on Johnson, on the north side of Johnson. We've got 43 houses on 2.8 acres. Yeah. Huge, single family home. How many? 2,400 square foot. How many uh, houses? 43 on 2.8 acres. Uh, no way. That doesn't it's sound unbelievable. Right. No, it they're kidding. I mean, they just go off. They're five cabinet homes. <laughs> they're, they're awful. I mean, and, they, and they're private roads. They just cabinet. took up yeah. one. Lot that was, you know, and There's just no place was, to drive. And yeah. when we had a meeting, several meetings in this very building about it, the developer said, No problem, you'll have this, you'll have that, it'll be fine. 43 Where are these? Yeah. It's uh, 174th between, between 173rd and 174th off of Alexander, just down. Oh, that's like 18 Alexander. units yeah. an acre. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, the application that we got is on uh, 178th and Johnson, and that's going to be a uh, 10 lot subdivision. And 
we should be getting the public notice here probably next month or somewhere in that vicinity. Johnson's going to be busy. Johnson, you know, would you, sometimes. Well, that's been sitting there for about six years. Yeah, uh, some of the some of the uh, acreages and some of the lots along in here in Aloha, we've gotten neighborhood meeting notices and, and nothing happens, and then neighborhood meeting notice and an application and nothing happens. So we will just have to see how it goes. Any questions? And how about some applause for Lyle? Thank you. Very, Very quickly, quickly, it's uh, time again for Washington County to have an open uh, enrollment period for their various uh, committees and boards. Uh, there's currently 14 that have openings. Some have one, some have a number of openings. Um, many of those are people who are currently on whose time is up, but they'll probably you know go again. And, and normally, um, if they re-up, they get reappointed. Um, but there are always openings for people to fill. I've gotten on a number of them. Uh, just a few of them, AG and Vet Services, Fair Board, Fairgrounds, Advisory Committee, Northwest Area Commission on Transportation, Planning Commission, Public Safety Coordinating Council, Railroads, Urban Roads, and so on. So some of them, one of them meets only once a year. Most of them meet monthly or every other month. Um, they usually don't take up much you know, of your time. So if you have time to volunteer, the application is about a page and a half long. It's very easy, and you can email it or print it off and mail it in. They're due by November 12th. So if you go to the Washington County um, website, it's right there in the middle of uh, the top news story, kind of in the middle of it, real easy to find. Thank you. Um, before we go, one last word of business. Uh, it's our annual meeting when you to elect officers. Who wants to serve uh, as leadership in uh, the CPO program here? You. Really? I know that. I know Do you want to be the yeah. chairman again for another year? Actually, no. I'm going to step down and I'm not going to move forward with uh, being sheriff, uh, at least in the short term. So that means you guys got to figure that out. You kidding? Nope. I'm done. This has been a sucky year. I've been pushed by a planner. The CPO chair I've been spit on, yelled on, oh lied on, goodness. lied to. Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, um, I, I've just put a lot into the program. And uh, you know, I've been doing this uh, for eight election cycles, seven and a half years. And I'm just happy I get to end this when we're supposed to, which is uh, October, because when I was elected, it was March. So um, you know, who wants to be the chair? Making it sound real desirable. <laughs> 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 then, what a salesman. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I, I've had a rough year and uh, the workload's been pretty high. It's, I've been taxed for the Lower Reedville, TB Highway, um, just on and on. Oh, yeah, a little library, and I'm the, the president of the uh, Washington County uh, Public Affairs Forum. And that's really, that's wow. really one, one of the many things that, that I'm doing. It's just like, you know, okay. I've done this for a year. Free. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What do you well, do for a living? Uh, I try to sell real estate, and <laughs> I need to free up a little bit of time in order to do that. And this is one of the things that's getting axed. The trouble is, you're a tough act to follow. Well, I appreciate yeah, right. that. It's very flattering words. So. Do you have experience running CPOs? Yeah. Yes, uh, Steve does. Steve's oh, does a former he? chair. That's what I thought. I, I thought so. I yeah. respectfully decline because I, you know, I mean, this a little read bill and all the transfer. I, Spent thousands of hours just in the last couple of years on. I mean, and then I've been doing it for 15 years yeah, on the Lower Reed Bill. Yeah, you did way before that. Well, you know, I mean, I've been involved in CPO six for over 30 years. Yeah. As a lot of different things, including chair. But and I respectfully decline. I mean, it's. I mean, Eric said awful high expectations. I mean, he gets people to come to these meetings. <laughs> so, let me tell you, that's a tough job. <coughs> food. I bring well, snacks. Yeah. I mean, good luck. I don't know what you're going to find next month, but it's just not going to be me unless, unless we get a, you know, a hell of a good salesman that gets people in. And I'm just, uh, uh, you know, Either you guys pony up and get a chair, vice chair, um, CCI rep, and uh, and a secretary, but uh, um, or you know, is, is there anybody active? against the wall that's interested? Does somebody uh, make I wasn't looking at Eric's mother. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs>
Um, okay, <laughs> absent, um, I, we're five minutes over, and I'm kind of no, looking to conclude. <laughs> I'm looking to kind of conclude the meeting. Absent um, uh, a slate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call for um, the steering committee to meet at the same regular scheduled time that we meet in order to sort this out. And uh, that's just, that's uh, just, we don't have a slate, we don't have a slate. And, um, and th then what I do is I conclude the meeting by declaring CPO6 inactive. The steering committee will meet informally at the first Thursday in November. And I think it'd be a good time to reboot the organization. And I would like to thank you all for first being here. Second, uh, I'd just like to conclude and just say, hey, this has been a really fun ride. Uh, Washington County gave me a political petri dish, which I got to play with. And I got to take an organization that uh, had a lot of really cool things going on. Lyles Garcia was the, uh, the, uh, the chair before I took over. And I was shocked and in awe of how cool it was. And then I just put my spin on it and took it in a, a, diff a completely different direction. Um, and so for me, it's been great for the credibility. It's been great to put on my resume. Uh, made a lot of insanely cool contacts. And I got to say, it's just been a great place where we leverage some stuff. We got a library started. We got a business association started. And the, what's give, getting birth next right now, something Anthony and I are working on, is the Aloha Historical Society. We've seen some cool stuff come out of that. But um, what it takes is uh, somebody with a lot of energy, and we need to find that person. And that I've given what I can. And I also have to be honest with you all and say that I've given as much as I can, maybe a little bit too much. And I need to retrench because I'm um, feeling overcommitted. And, the com and that's just, I can't be any more honest with you with that. So with that, I'm going to say thanks. See ya. Let's give Eric a hand. Yeah. Okay. You're doing, you're doing cookies. Job. And what happens Thanks. if we don't get somebody to step in? Well, then you don't have an active CPO. Oh, okay. And that's um, then what you got to do is take your complaint straight to your commissioner. Mm -hmm. well, who's on the steering committee? That would be Lyles Me. and Bob and Rex and myself. Did I miss anybody? Is Just Anthony on the steering committee? No, I'm not. <laughs> well, you said we've been doing this for about eight years and some longer. You have to have come to so many general meetings and signed in before you could run for anything. And then there was supposed to be a, uh, the steering committee was supposed to meet two weeks. This was on the email I just got today with the meeting mm -hmm. on your newsletter. Um, supposed to week, meet two weeks after the annual general meeting of the CPO. Mm. Well, then maybe we have to meet in two weeks. I need to brush up on the bylaws. What was it the last page of your newsletter? Oh, okay. Well, then um, may, that may be the case. On the other hand, if I'm the outgoing chair, then <laughs> what I would say do that I have? if you have any interest in I'm anything, I <laughs> haven't been to <laughs> enough <laughs> meetings. If that's a problem, no one else has any wants to do. Well, then that's, that's, that's the problem. Yeah, but I've given enough. Oh, I know. You've got 9,000. Look, why? Why did I, you know who was eligible? Because it looked like the eligibility was. Well, that's because everybody's been the same for the last eight at, years. At this and point, you could probably just. Because I've been doing it for eight years, and Eric, wow. about the same time. Yep. But Lyle's been doing it for a lot longer than that, and Steve, and. Yeah, you know, I'd it's say the same people doing up, it all the time. Yeah. You could probably just say, "Hey, I want to serve," and the steering committee would go. I wish they did, but I've just been getting to it was totally unrelated. It was so lax when I came on board. I was elected. Yeah, there was no comparison between now and it was seven years ago. <laughs> it's huh. well, no, that's, <laughs> um, that's that. So we figure it out in two weeks or four weeks. But uh, um, grab some cookies. There's beer in the corner. Have a beer, root beer anyway, and uh, see y'all. Bye bye. Thank you. Well, I just get you guys to come. That's a fine. Don't worry, we can always be having meetings. There will always be more meetings. Have no fear of that. It wasn't too much